So I want to thank the FSHD Society and all of you who are joining um, for the opportunity to share some thoughts on therapeutic targets and clinical trials. You can see I've stolen the, the headline news graphic here to really emphasize the pace of development um, in this area in a steady stream of advances both in our understanding of FSHD, but also in our knowledge about how to run clinical trials. I think we're really at a transition point. And I know some of you may have heard me make this statement before, but where, where the conversation is really switched from what causes FSHD to how we can treat it. Um, but many of the advances that will be required to design and run these clinical trials will also teach us and fill gaps in our knowledge of FSHD in general. These are my disclosures, and I, I do just want to point out the, the four in green there. Um, I'll be mentioning each of these companies um, in the context of this, this talk. So by all accounts, the last few years, it's been a really busy time. Um, we had uh, Acceleron who announced their top line results from their phase two clinical trial, which was a positive study. It was a drug designed to increase muscle growth and, and they were able to achieve that. Um, but the, the company uh, stopped their drug development program um, because they, they weren't sure that they were seeing changes in strength and function. We have companies like Dyne Therapeutics who publicly announced novel programs in FSHD, and they've got a whole platform that's a new kind of drug that's a antibody linked to a oligonucleotide uh, conjugate. And we'll talk more about this uh, later in the talk. They're also helping support us as we gain some of the information about the tools that we need for clinical trials. We started a clinical trial research network. It really started out as just four sites in 2016, and it's, it's grown, I think, as the field has grown. To this year, I think we're going to have over 20 sites that will be part of our, our trial research network. And so I think that's, that's been uh, very exciting to see that collaboration build. And of course, it's hard to miss. We had Fulcrum Therapeutics who, who just last summer announced the top line results from their phase two um, clinical trial. Um, but of course, overlying all of this, as it's been affecting every aspect of our lives, has been the COVID pandemic, which has also been affecting our ability to do research. But one thing I'd say is all of the companies in the space and, and the researchers as well are really committed to this idea of continuing FSHD research. And I have to say there's been tremendous amount of advances even in the setting of the COVID pandemic, which I think is very encouraging. And of course, here I just have the current clinical trial landscape. We've had two phase two studies that have completed in the last three years. This is, this is kind of amazing to think about um, when uh, just you know eight years ago, we really had none going on. Um, we have Fulcrum, whose open label extension is still currently running, and some of you may be taking part in that. Um, there was a single site study of growth hormone and testosterone that I think is completed now, and we should be getting the readout of that clinical trial sometime in the near future. We have a very large initiative we're starting now called MOVE, or Motor Outcomes to Validate Evaluations in FSHD. And this is a study to help us gain longer term data about um, how changes in function predict changes in quality of life and important events in someone's uh, life, like having to use something like a walker or a wheelchair but also looking at the use of things like whole body MRI 
and, and muscle biomarkers because there's several companies that need more information to really plan their clinical trials. And then there's several other companies who publicly announced that they have programs in FSHD and they'll be having clinical trials, I think, starting really in the next one to three years. And this includes Dyne Innovity, who some of you may have heard talk about their programs, but we also have researchers like Scott Harper, whose, whose drugs are reaching the point where they're close to human clinical trials. This is my agenda for the day. I am going to step back and talk just a little bit about the pathogenetics and potential targets for treatment. FSHD is a complicated disease. I find even when I'm giving lectures to medical students, they often have trouble with this pathological mechanism, but I'm gonna to try to say enough so we can understand how we're thinking about targeting FSHD in clinical trials. I wanna talk about two areas that have been absolutely essential for drug development, but I don't know if they ever really get enough attention, the development of cell lines and animal models, because this is really the backbone that these drug development programs are, are built on. Um, I'm going to give you an example of a clinical trial. We'll talk a little bit about the Fulcrum clinical trial um, and the results of that study um, and put it in the context of the new studies that are, are hopefully starting in the next few years. And then I'll talk a little bit about what we've been doing in the research network. So I wanna start with the, the, the genetics of the disease. And to put it in a nutshell, in FSHD, we have a gene, it's called DUX4. It's normally turned off, but in FSHD, it gets turned on. The product of that gene, also called DUX4, is toxic to muscle cells. This is from a biopsy of a patient with FSHD that was then grown in culture. The green color you see here is a myotube. Those blue circles are the myonuclei. That pink color, that's DUX4 protein. This is just a cartoon illustration of what's known as the D4Z4 region on chromosome four, which is where the mutation occurs for FSHD. Each of these triangles is a repeat. Many of you have heard this is a repeat disorder. These repeats are quite large. There are several thousand base pairs uh, large. That's large enough to contain the reading frame for a gene, in this case, DUX4. When we think about a healthy individual, this region on chromosome four is normally highly methylated. And so if we think of our chromosomes like a cookbook and the genes or the recipes contained inside the cookbook, the volume that corresponds to chromosome four, it's shrink wrapped in plastic. This is what methylating that region does in a way. It makes it impossible to open up that cookbook and you, you can't read the recipes inside. So in FSHD, either for type one, due to a deletion of those repeated units, or in type two, due to mutations in genes that have a role in methylating this region, it causes decreased methylation, which is similar to ripping the plastic wrap off that cookbook. Now you can open it up and you can read the recipe that's inside of it and contained inside of it is the recipe for one gene, DUX4. But it turns out this recipe is missing its last line. So if it was a recipe for a hamburger, it's missing the line that says cook until done. Um, and this, this equates to missing something called a polyadenylation sequence. It just tells the cell to make that protein. But it turns out about half of people have a polymorphism 
or a change in their genetics that can donate that last line of the recipe to the, the, the recipe for DUX4 to allow the cell to make it. So what do you need for FSHD? Decreased methylation, so ripping the plastic wrap off the cookbook, and then that extra line to add as the last line of the recipe to make DUX4. DUX4 stands for double homeobox four. It's a transcription factor normally expressed in our germline, but not our adult tissues. It's one of these genes that has a role like when we're embryos in the four to eight cell range where it's turned on for a very short period of time, and then it's sort of turned off for the rest of our lives. There's a couple exceptions to this. We can see it in sort of the pre-sperm and testicles, and we're not exactly sure what the role there is. Um, but what it, the important point is it's activating many hundreds of genes. It activates an early embryonic program, and that program in an adult cell is toxic to the cell. And it's toxic in a number of different ways. It can cause oxidative stress, it can cause inflammation to occur. It can um, start an apoptotic program that just means it causes the cell to die. Because DUX4 can alter many hundreds of genes, most of our companies that are thinking of targeting FSHD, they're looking to target it upstream at either methylation or at the DUX4 mRNA itself because it's much easier to consider addressing the disease at the head, right, than at one of those downstream branches. So when we think about targets for therapy, we have this cartoon illustration of the whole pathological pathway where you can see it includes the methylation in the D4Z4 region, the production of that DUX4, uh, uh, mRNA and protein, and then all the downstream effects. And you can really approach the disease at any of those points. But I think the ones that we're most excited about and that are happening now are really approaching disease upstream here. Um, and most of them are using RNA-based therapies. You'll see initials like AON, ASO, RNAi. They're just mean they're using RNA chemistry to target something specifically. And this is a type of a gene therapy. And most of the companies that are very close to clinical trials are really right here. They're targeting that DUX4 mRNA. When we think about the classes of drugs that are being developed for FSHD, um, we're really in a good place. So there's a number of different classes the FDA thinks about when they're thinking about drug development. Most of the drugs fall into this class of small molecules. This includes things like Tylenol, probably most of the, the drugs that you would be taking on a regular basis would fall into this category. As I've mentioned, we're, there's a lot of interest in these RNA-based therapies. Some of them have been approved for other diseases like Duchenne muscular dystrophy or spinal muscular atrophy. Gene therapies, these can cross over a little with the RNA-based therapies, but usually they're using some sort of virus vector to deliver either the gene itself or a regulatory molecule into the cell that then has a, a, a more permanent effect on the cell's functioning. And then there's something called cell therapy that many of you have heard about or are interested in, which are regenerative therapies like stem cells. And I think all of these classes are being discussed and developed for FSHD. And so this raises the prospect for a very robust drug pipeline. So when we think about drug development, in order to really get commercial programs up and running or even academic programs, you need to have ways to test drugs in bulk and to test whether drugs get into tissues 
and have the effect we want them to have. And I want to spend just a little time talking about this. I'm going to start with these patient-derived cell assays because they really help transform the field. Um, it is what it sounds like. There are cells that we get from people with FSHD. It can be from your muscle or your skin. We then take it into the laboratory. We chemically alter those cells to make them revert to an earlier form. And the reason we want to do this is so we can keep growing them over and over. Once we've got them in that state where we can grow them sort of indefinitely or for extended periods of time, we can then chemically manipulate them to grow into the tissues that we're interested in, in this case, muscle precursors or muscle cells. And then you can take this and you can have these large well plates where you put cells like this in thousands of different little dishes that will grow the cells. And you can automate this process where each one of those little tiny wells gets a different drug from a drug library. And what this enables us to do is it enables us to screen thousands of potential drugs for FSHD at the same time and use those cells as they grow up and start to express duct spore as a readout whether or not the drugs are working. So anything that prevents Dux4 or its downstream targets from being expressed in those cells would be a candidate for a drug of interest in the disease. These are just several examples of studies that have been done screening large drug libraries. And at least a couple of them have identified drugs you may have heard of. We've been interested in the beta agonist because they're available and potentially testable. And in this model, they were shown to modulate Dux4. There's a company, Fascio Therapies, that their main target was a drug that they identified screening a drug library like this. And less Mopamod, the fulcrum drug, also was discovered in this way by screening a, a large drug a library using this cell model approach. The other thing that's really important for drug development are animal models. And this helps us ensure that drugs can reach muscle tissue and then have a desired effect we also can ask some questions about dosing if we're going into animals. And we have several animal models that have been developed for FSHD. There's an inducible mouse model. This just means what it sounds like. We've created a mouse where we can turn ducks four on and off on will based on something we would put in the animal's food. There's transgenic mice. This means that we take the human D4Z4 region and we put it in a mouse. It turns out this is somewhat toxic to the mouse that doesn't normally have Dux4 expressed in it. Um, the mouse that survived that can do this doesn't really have a muscle disease, but does have changes in its skin and eyes and has the molecular changes that you could follow um, for FSHD. There's a xenograph mouse. I call this the island of Dr. Moreau mice. You may remember that film where a mad scientist combined different animals into what, of course, in that movie were monsters. But in this case, what it means is we're taking human muscle cells and we're growing them inside a mouse. The advantage of this model is that the tissue is human tissue then that we're able to test. And then there's a zebra fish that has been developed that mimics Dux4 pathology. You can see it here. This is a healthy appearing zebra fish. You can see the zebra fish that's designed to have the molecular change in FSHD 
his skinnier appearance. And when you look at their muscle, you can see there's a clear difference in the appearance of the muscle. So what I wanna do next is I wanna turn the corner and we're gonna take a few steps forward. We've used our cell model now to identify a drug. And what do we do now when we go to create the clinical trial? And the clinical trial I wanna use for an example is the clinical trial that Fulcrum did. And all of the slides I'm showing you are available publicly on their website. So there's nothing here that's not in the public domain. I think the first big success of the Fulcrum study was that they were able to complete the trial in the middle of the pandemic. That's really an amazing feature if you think about it. And they finished their recruitment in about six months, which really, I think, gets at this idea that somehow it's going to be difficult to run clinical trials in FSHD. People are quite motivated for clinical trials right now. The type of study is a randomized placebo-controlled double-blind study. What this means is you don't know what you're going to get. You're randomized to get one thing or another. The placebo control tells you some people will get an active drug and some people won't. Um, and the double blind just means people like me won't know what you're taking and you're not going to know what you're taking um, either. It was in 80 individuals at 18 sites in five countries, so it really was an international study. It was originally planned for six months, but they ended up having to expand that time frame to about one year because of the pandemic interfering with their visits. But you're, as you're going to see, this was maybe a good thing for them. What is less mopamod? Well, it's a drug. It's a P38 inhibitor. It's a class of enzyme that has very broad effects, including anti-inflammatory effects. The reason they picked it out was they used those cell-derived models I talked about. And this is just an illustration of it showing the bars up here are showing DUX4 and DUX4 targets. The lower the bar, the more it's been inhibited. And you can see there's a dose-related inhibition of DUX4 that they were able to see in these cells. On the right, these are other genes that are important for muscle growth, but that you wouldn't want to inhibit. So inhibit DUX4 with out off target effects on other things we wouldn't want to be inhibiting. And so made it a, a drug that was of interest. It turns out it's a drug that's already had clinical trials for other conditions and more than 3000 individuals had been dosed. And so we already had a lot of safety data on this drug. When we look at Fulcrum, we really owe them a debt of gratitude because they took many concepts which were just starting to be described in the field and they made them operational in a clinical trial. Their primary outcome, what they looked at first was a molecular target. So DUX4 targets expressed in human biopsies as their primary readout. This means they took a biopsy before you were treated and they took a biopsy after you were treated, and they looked for evidence that their drug had tamped down DUX4. They had a broad array of secondary and exploratory measures, and some of these that we'll talk briefly about, like whole body MRI and reachable workspace, were really new in their clinical trial. When we think about inclusion and exclusion criteria, this is getting at a concept that we call external validity of a, of a study. And it really gets at how well does the study we, the people we included in the study match a general FSHD population. The problem that they were trying to get at was that there's a lot of variability in FSHD. And so the question they had is how do we select muscles 
better risk for changing over shorter time frames. And what they were able to, to see was that there's an MRI sequence called a stir sequence. It usually means there's water in the muscle. And in this case, that reflects inflammation going on in the muscle. And that this was a, a sign of molecular activity. This is just showing you that stir signal. It appears bright white, so it's sort of easy to see. And if you biopsy these stir positive muscles and compare them to muscles that aren't stir positive, you can see the level of those DUX4 targets is much higher in those tissues. It turns out there's also another feature of muscles that may be predictive of having changes over shorter time frames. And it's sort of intuitive. Muscles that are already showing some change going on inside of them, but they're not completely wasted, are also more likely to change over a shorter time frame. And so this gave them an inclusion criteria where if you just randomly sample the muscle, about 50 to 60% would show those DUX4 targets. Uh, when you did your molecular analysis. But if you use stir positivity and muscles that have a fat fraction between a different uh, number, about 10 to 50%, you can increase the sensitivity of those DUX4 targets to over 95%. They also had a lot of developments in other outcome measures of interest to the field. MRI has been of a lot of interest that we might see changes in muscles on MRI before we saw changes in strength or function. They worked with a company that has this novel technique that looks at mapping all the muscles in the body um, in a semi-automated way. So uh, one of the problems with MRI is the amount of work it takes someone after you collect the images to identify each individual muscle and see what's happening in it. This company has a process that's essentially automated to do this. And here you can just see individuals whose severity is going from mild on the left to a, a more severe amount of muscle involvement on the right. The color that's yellow or gray represents more fatty replacement or fibrosis in that muscle. And you can just see that that yellow and gray color is increasing as people become more severely affected, meaning this may be a reasonable thing to be measuring in the course of a clinical trial. They also really looked at a new measure for the amount of space that someone's able to reach into with their arms. This is known as your reachable workspace, the volume of space that you can actively use. They repurposed an existing technology called a Connect sensor. It's a 3D camera. Some of you may remember it because it was included with the Xbox gaming system. And so it's kind of novel what they did. They took that camera, they had people do a very systematic set of movements. And what they got out of it was a three-dimensional uh, illustration of the volume of space that someone could reach into. And they had another of other measurements that they um, were validating in this study. When we look at the results of the study, starting with their primary outcome, was the molecular change in the muscle from before and after treatment. Here, each of these dots is an individual. The blue dots were getting a placebo. The yellow ones were getting um, the treatment. The first thing to notice is even with the inclusion criteria we used, there was about a thousand fold difference between the highest level of DUX4 targets and the lowest. And what you can see is over time, there was really no treatment effect, no evidence that the drug was reducing these ducts for targets in muscle. This is another way of looking at the same thing. 
think of the dotted line as being a line that's showing no change at all. If you go to the right of the dotted line, it means that the drug was helping. To the left means the placebo was doing better. And you can see they're essentially straddling this line. So they saw no real effect on the molecular biomarker. We can use a similar plot to look at all of those other secondary and exploratory measures they included. The dotted line again means there's no change going on in the measure. To the right of the dotted line means the drug's doing better. To the left means the placebo's doing better. And you can see that for the molecular biomarker, there was no change. But I think you can see if you look across all these secondary measures, there's a trend towards them moving to the right. So a treatment effect where the drug was maybe helping. And we can see it in a number of different categories. Structural ones related to what we see on the MRI, patient reported and just um, how much are you feeling better after receiving the treatment? And then functional things like the amount of space you can reach into with your arms. And you can see that there's some evidence for improvement across those domains. So while the study was technically negative, it didn't reach its primary goal, it was quite encouraging because there were a number of areas where it showed improvements. So if we think about our take-homes from this, Fulcrum will be reviewing with the FDA and making decisions regarding future development um, in the near future. Um, they still have their open label data to, to report. The DUX4 biomarker and the way it was chosen needs us as, as the FSHD community to get them more information for those next companies coming forward who may want to use that in their clinical trials. The whole body MRI also needs us to get a little more data to understand how big a change is important in that measure and what it means. Um, but I do think that trials like this and the Acceleron study that went before it sort of dispel a myth which was that we were not going to be able to see improvements in FSHD because it was such a heterogeneous or slowly progressive condition. Because in both studies, we were able to see movement either on biomarkers like the MRI or in strength or functional measures. And so I think this is quite encouraging as we move towards future drug development. I'm starting to run a little short on time, but I do want to talk a little bit about some of the classes of drugs that are about one to two years from entering first in human studies and some of the efforts that we've been doing. You're going to hear a lot about these RNA therapeutics in the next few years. Um, many of you have heard of antisense oligonucleotide therapy because they've been approved for other diseases. It is an RNA therapy that just means they can use the RNA sequence like a key to recognize a particular genetic sequence in the cell. And so they can trigger a very disease targeted response to the drug. Um, here you can see lots of different ways that these RNA therapies could affect cellular processes. But for FSHD, most of these drugs are really targeting the ducts for mRNA. So they're acting at this level. There's proof in those animal models I talked about that this approach is going to be effective. This is from one of those xenograft mice. It's just showing if we pretreat them with one of these RNA-based therapies that knocks down ducts for, you can see it in the muscle of those animals. Higher on this scale means higher DUX4 or DUX4 targets. Lower means lower levels. And the green ones, which have been treated with the RNA therapeutic, I think you can see are lower. 
It's also been shown to work in these inducible mouse models as well. And several of the companies coming forward in FSHD have what I consider a very novel platform for doing this. One of the barriers to this class of drugs is if you give it IV or you just inject it under the skin, not very much of it gets inside the muscle. And so that's a problem when what you primarily want to treat is the muscle. And the way these companies are getting around it is they're attaching an antibody or a fragment of an antibody that recognizes a receptor that's just on the muscle to help target the muscle. They then have a linker that connects to one of those RNA-based drugs we've talked about, and that delivers the RNA uh, therapy directly to the muscle where it can have an effect. Um, Dyne has a platform like this. Avidity as well has a similar platform. And so I think we're likely to see one of these drugs going into trials in the next one to two years. But there are other approaches being explored. Scott Harper's group has been working on something called RNA interference. In the version that they're doing, it's given like a gene therapy, a virus delivers it to the muscle cell, it enters the muscle cell, and it has a process that can last a very long time that occurs. And so it's somewhat permanent change to the cell to knock down Dux4. We have other groups that are looking at other approaches like gene editing, like the Jones lab, that I think will be entering trials in the next several uh, years. I wanna spend just the last couple minutes talking a little bit about our research network and what we're doing to help hasten drug development. This is just a list of outcome measures where we really still need to learn more to help these companies get ready for clinical trials. This includes our blood-based and muscle-based biomarkers, our use of MRI, and even our understanding of some of our functional measures. This is our research network. Um, as it exists now, you can see we're adding a number of sites right now. We'll have 20 sites, I think, by the end of this year who will be participating. And it really, this is the whole notion of it takes a village to raise a child. All these different funding groups have helped us create this network, including the FSHD Society, who did have a key role in our development um, from very early in the process of when we formed the network. The studies that we have running on our network are all meant to fill gaps in our understanding. Some of you may have taken place and uh, taken part in Resolve. This was looking at strength and functional measures and patient reported measures. The data from this has already been used by companies like Fulcrum and their planning of their clinical trial. We currently have three separate companies who are looking at data from this study to help them design their clinical trials. So your participation is having a very real effect from these studies. We have a Wellstone study that really set the model for what we're doing with MRI and muscle biopsies. Um, and we have the new study called MOVE that's really meant to, to overcome some new gaps that came up at the end of the fulcrum study in our understanding of MRI and the use of muscle biopsies so we can help these companies feel more confident as they run their clinical trials. So in conclusion, I think we're in a really good space. We have animal models and cell models available to start testing new therapeutics. We have our network developed to help train personnel, get ready for clinical trials, and fill some of the gaps in our knowledge that still need to be filled. Um, Fulcrum's in the process of deciding their next step. Hopefully, we'll all as a community hear uh, more shortly about what they're planning to do. 
We have other companies like Diamond Avidity planning first in class, first in human studies for novel platform drugs that include RNA therapeutics. We have our academic researchers who are working on other approaches. And of course, there are also companies who may be developing therapies important for FSHD, but not necessarily disease targeted. This can include classes of drugs like the myostatin inhibitors. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Statlin. Uh, great presentation, as always. Um, really appreciate it. And um, I'm Jamshid uh, Arjuman with the FSHD Society. It's a pleasure to, to be here and to uh, moderate the Q&A session. There's been a series of questions that have come in. And in fact, one of the first ones that I was going to, uh, I was thinking of asking you as a starter. So, uh, um, but somebody already asked, asked it here, which is fantastic, um, is what do you think are the biggest bottlenecks right now on the road to developing an effective treatment for FSHD? Is it lack of funding, lack uh, of patients for clinical trials, lack of scientific understanding or anything else? It's a very good yeah. question. Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. And I mean, part, part of me, and maybe a little disingenuously, would want to say, well, all of those can be bottlemark, bottlenecks. The, and that's true to a degree. I think probably right now, the one that we're really trying to, to solve most of the companies that are, are thinking about um, disease targeted therapies, they're wanting a little more information about the, the biomarker that might be used to show their drugs are getting to muscle and having an effect and to help them pick their dosing. And then the outcomes they may use in shorter studies like a six month study, which might include MRI, we're, we're, we have a study that we're doing to try to help them get this data because we think if we can get it for them, it may accelerate their programs. But the truth is, they it, once they're ready to move forward, those may not be barriers to them to going ahead and starting their studies. But you were right, because all of the things you listed can be a barrier for different studies, depending on, for example, how, how well they're financed, right? And how many studies we have running at the same time. So far, people volunteering has not been a problem for the studies, but if we had five studies running at the same time, that might be an issue. Great, yeah. And now uh, you mentioned uh, one of the uh, issues might be um, to show that the uh, drug is actually reaching the target tissue, the muscle, um, somebody mentioned that uh, the Jones lab, uh, Peter uh, Takaka Jones's lab, is creating the mini pig model of FSHD. You didn't mention that, I believe, in your uh, animal model slides. But is yeah, that gonna... I, I didn't because I, I don't think it's quite it's quite done yet. But mm -hmm. uh, it would be on there. Yeah. So a larger mammal model is actually incredibly useful um, because it mimics more of our what happens in a human. Um, the dosing from it would be important. You can do more sophisticated studies with it. Um, and so I, you know, models are um, important. Having different types of models are important. I think there's sometimes this notion that all we need is one model, but that's not really true. Having a nice array of different models in, in animals tends to make for a more robust drug pipeline. Great. Um, there are a number of questions about the uh, fulcrum trial, and one of them actually is uh, um, that the results came out earlier uh, in the middle of the year, but now, but uh, since the trial has ended, there's been open label extension. That's the and additional data has been collected. Um, is that going to help, or um, maybe see if the de drug is effective, or um, Will they, do you anticipate they're going to share the results uh, to, with the public uh, when uh, they finish the open uh, label extension? 
Yeah, uh, again, a very good question. So, I mean, what's really interesting about, of course, their open label extension is in a way it's, it's what we call a crossover study. The people who are getting placebo are going to suddenly switch to where they're getting the drug. And so one thing we may be able to see is whether there's an effect of switching to the drug on some of the outcomes we're measuring. The other thing that's important in, a, in, in an open label extension is the durability of effect. Is, is the effect we thought we saw in the clinical trial going to persist or is it going to wear off over time? And so, yes, there's very important data you can get um, from that, not just about if it's working, but also continued safety data. So, yeah, I do think it's important whether it will have a, a large impact on their ability to get, say, a marketing authorization for their drug, it's a little too early to know. We'd have to see what that data showed. Are you aware of any uh, side effects with lost mouth and mouth? Um, all, all drugs have side effects. Um, there, there have not been any really clear side effects that have, um, you know, distinguished themselves from the placebo groups. Um, so this drug has been very well tolerated as far as it goes for drugs. But remember, if the side effect happens in you, that won't matter that they weren't able to see it between, you know, comparing one group to another, you'll still have a side effect. So there's sort of the population level we think about in the individual level. Um, there are side effects from the drug in, in, that individuals may experience, but there's no red flags of anything at this point that would have us concerned. Great. And um, in your presentation, you mentioned uh, beta-2 um, adrenergic uh, agonists and um, showed some data that um, it reduced DUX4 expression. Um, could this repurposed drug be a low-hanging fruit? Is there anybody looking to run a trial? Um, um, yes, the answer is it is. I would consider it low-hanging fruit. Um, we are trying to run a trial. It turns out it, it, it is sort of an uphill battle to get funds to run a trial. Um, you can run a small trial if you, if you just have a small number of individuals and um, if you don't use a placebo control to get some initial data for a, a relatively small amount of money. But as soon as you want to start thinking about getting uh, an actual authorization for a drug, which requires you to be working with the FDA, and then thinking about trials with placebo controls, the costs go up quite tremendously. Um, so we're trying to get money right now to do what I would call a early phase two study, looking at a few different doses and looking at the changes in the volume in the muscle is an early signal that the drug's getting to the muscle and having an effect. Oh, that's great. So that's one of the bottlenecks that was come up as funding. <laughs> that, one, that one's funding, yes, absolutely. <laughs> no. Excellent. Um, and you just touched on this and somebody was asking uh, how many phases are there uh, in clinical trials before something gets approved? Could you just very briefly touch on that? Yeah, I mean, this is a, I think this is actually probably a very worthwhile separate topic. And my guess is that the FSHD Society has had someone talk on this. But the, yeah, there's in general, what you hear about are, are three, three phases. Um, these are the active phases of, of drug development before marketing, but there's really more than that. There's something called phase zero. This is before you even start testing the drug where you're sort of testing your outcome measures. Um, phase one usually is safety. Is it safe to give a drug? And then what, what dose do we give? Do we know what dose would be required? Phase two starts to ask a more pertinent question. Um, is the drug having an effect that we want to see it have? And that can be on a biomarker or on something functional. And then phase three, we're usually asking a question of, does it work? Um, each of these phases, as you might have guessed, typically requires more and more individuals. So a larger number of people in those studies the, um, 
because FSHD is a rare disease and because we have no treatments and it has a large impact on people's lives, there are accelerated pathways that FDA has developed. Um, FSHD might have drugs that qualify for that. That just typically means you don't have to run two phase three studies to get approval, which would be very hard in a rare disease. There is also a phase four study, but this is usually after something's already been approved for marketing, and it just means we're going to follow it after it's marketed to make sure it's safe. Great. Thank you. Um, there were several questions about um, different companies and where they are. One of the questions was, um, uh, Avidity had made an announcement that they would start clinical trial in 2022. And I think in your presentation, you uh, kind of gave a range uh, of the next two to three years, maybe of uh, companies starting their trials. Do you know if anything has changed for any of the companies, if they're delaying or if there's been delays or not? Yeah, I, I, I think what, what I, I, I hope I was saying was one to three years. The, um, yeah. Yeah, the, there, there are some companies that have a timeline where they're hoping to get, usually they'll, they'll say they're IND, which just means they're permission to do a study um, in 2022. The, um, whether they would get that study started by the end of the year will depend on the company. Um, so yes, there are studies that, uh, that, that on an optimistic side hoping could start in 2022. There are companies that have drugs that are not specific for FSHD that may come in and do a study very quickly. So they may have drugs that are already in, well, you know, in development, and they may also come in and do a study, which could happen in the next year. Um, but I think in general, probably looking in that one to three year time frame. Um, there may be a couple companies that are going to beat it. There was certainly another company that discussed doing a study in 2022 as well, um, but I don't think they were going to do it in the U.S. Great. And um, along the same lines, people uh, were asking about uh, updates on companies that may not have been listed in your slides, like Arrowhead, Myosia, any other companies. Do those fall within that realm that you just discussed? Yeah, so each of these, I didn't list every company. I, I sort of try to limit myself to companies where I'm pretty sure they've publicly been announcing their program. That doesn't mean that they haven't publicly announced their program. Um, I, I think each of these companies, you know, have been discussing getting their study started. Um, and, and yes, it, it, any one of them might have a study, you know, earlier. The pieces that would go into getting their first in human study is they have to have a, a design um, that's approved by regulatory uh, authorities. And then they have to you know, reach out to sites and train them and get them ready to do the study. Um, this, that, that process usually does take about six months though. So that, that's, that's sort of the time frame. If they haven't started it, then they're at least gonna be about six months out. Great. And uh, just, I think we're running out of time, but I wanted to ask two more questions. One of them, there's been a series of questions about uh, rebuilding muscle. So if there is a drug that can uh, stop disease progression, um, it, are there drugs that can uh, rebuild the lost muscle? Uh, and specifically, um, are stem cell therapies, and I think uh, somebody from the Ukraine mentioned uh, that there were stem cell companies that are offering treatment. Uh, are any of those legit? Right. I, I, I don't want to talk about a specific company that I know nothing about because it wouldn't be fair. What I would say is if someone is, is offering stem cells and they're wanting you to pay for it right now, then that's I, that would raise a red flag for me. The, the, the place for stem cell therapies at the moment is in clinical trials. No one's proven that they work. There are several companies that are considering stem cells for muscle disease. Um, they're new. There's been attempts in the past to do types of stem cells in muscle disease, and they haven't been that successful to date. 
but the technology, like all our technologies, is advancing and changing. And so what I would say is, is keep, I would keep sort of in tune and we likely will see companies that will have regenerative therapies. But I should just say something about FSHD in general. I think if we have a therapy that can stop progression, can really stop the, the, the process that's causing damage, you have the ability to um, potentially regenerate and, and heal some in your muscles. And so if we really had an effective therapy, you may find that you're improving beyond just stopping progression. You may get better, but we, we'll have to wait and see. Yeah. No, that's great. And uh, one last question. I think this has come up several times and you may have heard about it. Uh, there was a recent publication uh, by Sharif Tabit uh, in uh, uh, about myo the development of myo AAV. This is a uh, uh, animal associated virus that is uh, targets muscle much more efficiently than the standard AAV9 uh, that's currently being used. Um, uh, any um, you may have seen even the New York Times article uh, profile that that they did on. on uh, um, um, any uh, any comments on how that technology could help uh, in FSHD? Well, I, yeah, so, so when we think about gene therapies, now remember FSHD is a little different than some diseases that, that they're thinking of gene therapies for. Um, for recessive diseases, they're often talking about gene replacement therapies. This is where a vector that's a virus carries a copy of a gene into the cell and that cell then makes that protein. That's not, of course, what we're talking about in FSHD. In FSHD, you need to kind of knock down something that's there. Um, it can be delivered by a virus and, and certainly some people, like I said, the, the Harper group has been looking at this as a model for delivering their RNA-based therapeutic. Um, having one that's more efficiently targeting muscle is very important. The other reason why it would be important is there's a safety concern with the viral vectors. And so if we have a more efficient one that could do it with lower um, viral loads, um, this would likely make it a safer vector for delivering the drugs. Wonderful. Thank you very much.